what you get when you get old, you know. Scripture reading today, God's Word is 118 through 4 of Psalms. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, His love endures forever. Let those who fear their Lord say, His love endures forever. So be it. Good morning. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the opportunity that we can come, Lord, and to dig into your word, to sing songs and praises to you, Lord. Thank you to get equipped for this battle that we have, not with flesh and blood, but battles with principalities and powers, Lord. Equip us with your spirit. Lord, help us to have a heart of Jesus, to focus on the things above, not to build up treasures here on earth. And Lord, we do Thank you for the peace that comes with knowing Jesus. We will praise your name. We thank you for this church, Lord. And we thank you for the opportunities that we do have to minister and to reach out into our community. Lord, may you direct our steps, fill our hearts, Lord, that we will be your servants, devoted on you, and that it will be well with our soul no matter what we undertake until the day that Jesus Christ returns. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen. And Kim, it's okay to write down your prayers too, just so you know. So last week, Kim talked about Acts chapter 4. And I just gave her a little credit there about writing her prayers. It's okay to write your prayers. It's okay not to pray out loud. It's okay to pray out loud. What you need to do is pray. And I think Kim told us that. She said that we needed to have faith and that we needed to pray. And if we look at the pattern set forth in Acts chapter 4, you see that from the moment that Jesus uh, resurrects to the moment that he leaves the people are gathered together in prayer but we see that they're gathered together and they're fearful even when Jesus is there maybe even more so after Jesus is left but they are focused on resurrection because no one has ever walked out of a grave until Jesus Christ there is no religion that can claim that, anything else. That is something only done by the Spirit of God's power, the Son of God. He is the only one who has ever risen from the dead. And He has promised each and every one of you, if you believe in Him, that He will come back for you. That's what makes the difference. That's what Peter talks about in Acts chapter 4. And that's what scares the Sadducees to death is because they've preached all this time that there is no resurrection of the dead. But it's what our hope is for, what it's founded upon. If you notice in that song, um, and it is well, it says until that day. I don't know if you know much about that song and I wasn't prepared to say this, but basically he wrote that song where his family died out on the ocean. And it's, he said that it is well with his soul because he knows that he'll have to go through this world with the, with the sufferings and persecutions that come, but that's okay. Because his soul has a firm foundation in Jesus Christ, and he will spend all eternity with God. We've just got to make it through. And we've got to be focused on mission like the early church was, that we've got to proclaim that hope that we have. The rocks will cry out if we don't. Why would you not want to proclaim such a great salvation? So Kim also told you that you needed to put that faith into action. And that doesn't require selling everything that you've got, giving it to the... Wait a minute, that's a Bible verse though. Selling everything you've got, giving it to the poor, and then going and following Jesus. But it does require a heart that is not holding on to something else so that you don't do the things that Jesus wants you to do. If you're right here and you're in retirement age and you're living at your home, then I think your neighbor that you witness to 
is right where Jesus has you placed to be his hands and feet. So you go about with the little things that you have, this little, the, the gifts that this little church has. We know we have an Awanas program coming in, and we serve where we can, and we train up ourselves, and we're going to go into 2 Timothy before we go to Acts. We train up ourselves so that we have that knowledge. We're prayed up so that, that God hears our requests, and He will answer those. What good father doesn't give good gifts to his son, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit so that you'll be equipped for ministry? We're focused with one mind, one accord, because we want to see these children saved, especially our own, but all of them, that we want to see our friends saved, that we want to see even our enemies saved, because we were enemies when Christ died for us. We are, have done no more better things. In fact, we deserve God's wrath. But praise be to God that He sent His Son to take our wrath upon His shoulders so that we could have eternal life and as long as we have breath, live for Him, proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. And that's what Acts chapter 4 is about. We're going to talk a little more about it. Not that Kim didn't do a wonderful job. She set it up perfectly for me to go in even further with some of the things that are here in Acts chapter 4. So I've entitled this... The three P's. You remember that? The three P's. Prayer, proper living, and proclamation. Because that's what the church looks like now. And then we'll see other things that, that they do. We'll see that they even sell their possessions so that no one has need. They didn't sell their possessions because Jesus said, you've got to sell your possessions. They sold their possessions because like the man that walked away, they didn't care about these things anymore. They wanted everyone to be not in need. They considered what God gave them so that they could be rich with others, as the parable of the rich fool tells us. 2 Timothy 2.15. What's that verse? Say it on all. I hear it going. Study to show yourself approved... A workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly divides the word of truth. If you get those elements, whichever version that is, or if that's a uh, comprising of versions, you got the basics. <coughs> Study. Why? To show that you're approved, that you're, you're acceptable, you've done your part. The early church spent time together studying the scriptures, praying to God, that they knew Jesus Christ would return because they knew that they could trust in, in Him. They also knew that the Holy Spirit was coming, but they didn't understand that fully. But the power was coming, the gift that was promised to them. And I guarantee you they studied scriptures even more trying to figure out what all is going to happen here. Well, we know exactly what's happened here because we've got Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, and so on. And the Holy Spirit came in power. If you haven't seen this pattern yet, I'll give you the answer. So that you could proclaim. Not so that you could speak in tongues. Not that you could, so that you could have miracles of healings. These things might happen, but the Holy Spirit came so that you could proclaim Jesus Christ. We're going to see that in Acts chapter 4. We saw that in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came in what sounded like a mighty rushing wind and what looked like tongues of fire came down and landed on each one and they began in speaking in other languages because there were people gathered there from all over the world. So the Holy Spirit came and there was a miracle of speaking in tongues but it was so that the, the gospel message resurrection through Jesus Christ could be proclaimed to the world. And let it be known that God made this Jesus, who you crucified, we all crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And this promise, because Peter again is influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak, he speaks from the prophet Joel, this gift is for you, for your children, your grandchildren, doesn't matter about your sex, anything else. It is for everyone that believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This outpouring of God's Spirit so that you can proclaim the gospel message. Because you have this hope that you cannot be quiet about. Well, back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 8 we read, 
Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Paul is writing to Timothy. Paul is in jail. This is one of his. La this is his, possibly his very last letter. He, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's been out of prison plenty of times. And he doesn't worry about it. But this time he's got a feeling that he's not getting out of this, and he's writing to this young man to make sure that he takes up his cross, that he denies everything about the world, takes up his cross, whatever that may be, and follows Jesus. And this is a young man. We hope these, these children that we train up out of Iwana stay with it and, and stay with it, not, don't fall away, because the chances are, even if they go to Christian colleges nowadays, they fall away from God's Word. But God is faithful, and many of them come back. But we want to train up these children so that they know God's word, they know their mission in this world, and they've got to see it in our lives again. They've got to see genuineness, not hypocrisy. So we've got to really believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead, that we have eternal life if we believe in Him, and that He will come back for us. Because we will have trials and tribulations in this world. Everyone does, believers, non-believers. We, we live in a fallen, sinful world. But praise be that God has not taken His hand away, that God loves us, and that He loves us enough that He would give His Son to die for us. So Paul writes to Timothy, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's Word is not chained. You can study and read God's Word, and you can pray, and you can be active in your faith, as Kim said, proclaiming God's Word to someone else, and it will make a difference because God's Word will not come back void. It is not changed. It is the power that brings about salvation, and you have the privilege of being the messenger to proclaim God's Word. And you can't say you can't do it because the power of God was given for you to do that. And we're going to see that in Scripture again today. I don't know if you noticed in chapter 3, but when Peter reached down and told the man to get up and said, Silver and gold, I don't have any, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus. Luke does not write that the Holy Spirit filled him with power at that point. But Luke does write in, in chapter 4 that Peter is again filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's given these words to speak to those who have the authority to destroy his body, <laughs> but not his soul, right? I mean, they were already crucified. Jesus, he gave up his life willingly. They don't believe that, though. They think they snuffed Jesus out. And now it's time to snuff out his followers. So Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, but God's word is not chained. Verse 10, therefore, this is the conclusion I make from that. I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they may too obtain sal the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, and you won't find this in Scripture. I don't know if this is the first time Paul said it, or if he'd been saying it all along. Probably had. He'd probably been saying it on and on again, and he's saying now to Timothy again, listen, I, this that I keep teaching you, this is trustworthy. If we die with him, because I might die, and I don't want you to lose faith, if we die with Him, we also live with Him for all eternity. He's given us life now to face whatever comes our way. And if we die, Paul says it is gain for Him to die. If we die with Him, we also live with Him. If we endure, we also reign with Him. Understand that promise. If you don't fall back, if you make it to the end, if you're faithful to the end and you have the power of the Holy Spirit to, to keep you firm in your faith, then you will reign with Him. As you read and study God's Word, you will see time and time again a, a rewards for those who are faithful. You also see time and time again that you will be accountable for every idle thought or word even. I don't know about you, but that tells me I want to be going this direction, not this direction. And I know that I have the power of God in me just by being born again. We're not even talking about a filling of the Holy Spirit here. But just by be born, being born again, that the Holy Spirit is going to transform me and change me internally. It's not something I'm going to do myself. God's going to do it through me. 
but I've got to be reading, I've got to be praying, I've got to be joined together in fellowship. I've got to be focused on mission, not still living my life the same way that the Gentiles do. If we disown him, though, he will disown us. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Now think about those words in comparison to what Kim said and the faith that we have. And think about it about mustard seed faith. That that's all we need. Even when we're faithless, he is faithful. There is nothing that, that comes your way that you can't handle because of God's power living in you. But there's also a filling of the Holy Spirit so that you can proclaim Jesus, as we're going to read in Acts, is the cornerstone. That implies working again. Workmanship, as we see in 2 Timothy, that we are working towards something. We are working towards building the kingdom of God, building on the foundation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them even before God against quarreling about words. It is no value and it only ruins those who listen. And sad to say, that's part of the division in the church as we quarrel over words. Like what literally is the filling of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's huge in denominations. Verse 15, do your best to present yourselves to God. To God, not to man. As one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed who correctly handles the word of truth. So you've got to be reading God's word. You've got to be studying. And I challenge you now, come and be a teacher for Awanas or whatever position you're put in. And be studying that week. If you know that you're going to be teaching Sparks, then take home a book if you need to. If you, if you don't take a book, just be reading God's word. If you're reading God's Word, Scripture tells you that the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to you. And Jesus is the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. As long as you're reading God's Word, the Spirit will draw from that and pull out the words you need to say. You don't have to worry about it. And you've got proven curriculum in front of you just to follow the curriculum even if you don't. But you need to be there and prepared to answer questions because Satan's going to attack you and say, oh, you're no, you don't know. You don't have any reason to be a teacher or anything else. You need to let somebody else do this. That's his lies, his deceit. Like Kim said again, we do with what we have. Your love of Jesus and your willingness to teach, the Holy Spirit will use. And we will teach these children about Jesus Christ. So hopefully they don't waste their lives. For hopefully, first of all, that they'd make a decision to, to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. But second, that we ground them in the truth so when the lies attack them even more and more as they get out in the world, that they'll stand firm. Just like Paul's writing to Timothy. Verse 16, Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Now he's talking about the church speaking things like, well, let me give you an example. I mean, don't get mad at me. But when you're studying God's Word and you start putting in there, well, I think, <laughs> let's stick with what God's Word says. <laughs> I think it's fine for when you want to think about it and talk about it with your husband or in a small group maybe, but when we're teaching these children, all we need to do is stick with the basics. God loves you. He created you. This chair was created. It has a purpose, right? If it doesn't work functionally, well, it's not a chair, is it? You're created in God's image. He, but you sinned. You're like that broken chair. And he said, I'll fix you myself. And he sent his one and only son to take your sin and your shame from you. And you know, those topics are big topics for a little child. But when you just talk about God's love and that if they believe in Jesus that God will change them. That's all you need to do. Let God handle the rest. You be willing. You be prayed up. And today we're going to pray again specifically for Awanas. And I want you to pledge to pray for Awanas if you're in the same mindset as I am. 
And the Holy Spirit will do the rest. He'll give you the words to say, and we're going to find that in Acts chapter 4. And he will do the work. And Jesus said, Suffer not the little children to come to me. In fact, he said that you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven unless you come with that childlike faith. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenus and Fallacious. That's one reason I didn't give you those words. I don't know if I pronounced those names right, but we're going to go with that. Who have departed from the truth. How did they depart from the truth? These are people in the church, and the reason they departed from the truth is they believed this idle nonsense that they heard that said the resurrection has already taken place. Boom, we're back on the resurrection again. That's what my hope is built on is the fact that I know there's an empty tomb that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. He gave me a mission, the authority to do it, and the power to do it until He returns. So I don't need to live like the heathens of this world, the Gentiles of this world, those that don't know Jesus Christ, the way I did before. I need to live like I'm living on mission. Doesn't mean, like I said, that you've got to sell your house and go out to the foreign field because He might have called you to be right here in your workplace or in your community. You need to do with what you have, like Kim said, and use that faith. And then as you use that faith, He might call you to more faith, but you know, you'll have to see. <clears throat> they say the resurrection has already taken place, and what happens? They destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with the inscription, The Lord knows who are, who are His, so don't worry about it. Let God take care of the saving, but you be His vessel. He's given you the authority and the power to do it. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord, doesn't that sound like Acts chapter 2? Where Peter's quoting from Joel. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. What were the three P's? Prayer, proper living, turning away from godliness. We are called to be holy people. And then the third P was proclamation. So you've got to be a prayer for pe prayerful people. Kim hit that point last week. You've got to have holy living also. So is there anything you need to get rid of? I don't know, and I'm not pointing fingers. But if the Holy Spirit's pricking you and there's anything you need to get rid of, get rid of it. <laughs> Isn't this salvation worth working out with fear and trembling? Why in the world would I want to hold on to something that I know that's not right or something that would be a stumbling block? Paul said, I'll never even eat meat again if it causes someone to stumble. I hope that doesn't make anybody stumble because I like a good steak and some good ribs. But would I be willing to give it up? There's nothing that I won't be willing to give up with God's power living through me to tell someone else about Jesus Christ so that I'm not a stumbling block. There is nothing worth opposing my faith and my love for my Lord and Savior. Verse 20, In a large house there are articles that not only, not only of gold and silver but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some are for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. So we leave these things behind and we pursue those things. And we will produce fruit, fruit that comes from the Spirit. <clears throat> Flee from the evil desires of your youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We're not in this battle alone. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be, the kind, must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Why we study God's Word so that we can rightly handle the Word of truth. And that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. I said when I prayed that we're fighting a spiritual battle. 
And Satan is trying to have us do his will instead of God's will. That God's kingdom doesn't come that Satan stays in control and dominion of this world. But Jesus taught us to pray that God's will be done. His kingdom come. That we will forgive others because we have been forgiven. And that we won't fall into any temptation or snare from the devil because God will protect us and keep us from it as long as we're filling ourselves with His Word, as long as we're praying, as long as we're meeting together, as long as we realize we're on mission which we see is what the first, or the first church did, the early church. Satan, if he can't have your soul, wants to deceive you so that you're not effective in ministry. Serving and proclaiming. Three Ps are what? Prayer, proper living, and proclamation. You cannot keep quiet. 35 years roughly had, had happened in the church when Paul wrote those words compared to what we're looking at in, in Acts chapter 2. I told you last week, or Acts chapter 4, I told you last week that some time period has happened since Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. We don't know how long. We do know from Acts chapter 3 to Acts chapter 4, though, it's the same day and then the next day. Scripture tells us that. So I want you to think about this, these questions and think about how the early church would answer these questions compared to you and I. Who is Jesus to me? I know this early church, I see from their example that he was everything. I'll use myself instead of you. I say he's everything, but my life doesn't show it as strongly as them. Am I still holding on to the things of this world? Am I still enticed by them? And is that keeping me from the mission that God has given me? What will happen to me at the resurrection? It is, is it something that, that compels everything that I do? That I know that Jesus Christ is returning any day? And I have got to tell others about Jesus Christ? Or is it a part of my life? And I know that one day it will happen. And I know and when the opportunity comes up and I'm not doing something else, I'm going to proclaim it. But it, does it compel me like it compared this early church? Does my life mirror Jesus? His teachings. Do I want to be perfect like my heavenly Father is perfect? Do I want to have my cake and eat it too? Well, you know what? Your cake and eat it too is, is building treasures in heaven, period. Jesus tells us that. Don't build them here on earth. They won't last. You can't put your peace or hope in them. Am I living a life of faith that leads me to a life of prayer, proper living, and proclamation? Because this is what the early church was doing. Do you remember what Jesus did when he entered the temple in Jerusalem? He had to... And Evelyn's not here today. I was going to look for her. I knew she'd give me the answer. He had to clear the temple. John chapter 2 records Jesus' first clearing of the temple. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record his second clearing of the temple. Don't get that confused. In John chapter 2, this is right after we have the miracle of Jesus where he turns water into wine. When he says, don't worry, the wine that you think you need, that you think you run out of, ah, I'm going to make much better wine and it hasn't run out. Focus on me instead of what you had. There is reason for celebration. Jesus has come and you can be married into him and one day he'll claim you as his, his bride. Because we think that, oh, there's not reason to celebrate because Bobby has cancer. There's not reason to celebrate because I just lost all my, my job and whatever. My children have turned against me. There, there's reason to celebrate because there's a resurrection of the dead and if you focus on that ministry, God is faithful, even when you're faithless. And his word won't come back void. So I've got to rely even more on prayer, proper living, and proclamation. And in chapter 2, after that first cleansing, we read this. 
in John chapter 2, verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered what it, what it is, that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, this is the Jewish religious leaders, What sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. What's he talking about? Resurrection from the dead by himself. And he says, Destroy this temple, destroy my body. And the religious leaders question him, by whose authority are you cleansing the temple? Okay? We're going to see this in how they question Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. That's why I'm setting it up for this. The, other, uh, the second cleansing is found in the other three Gospels, like I said, and I'm going to read from Luke 19. In chapter 19, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as the King, the Promised One, the Anointed One, the Messiah. Hosanna, save us. And once again, though, he has to cleanse the temple. In Luke 19, verse 45, <clears throat> when Jesus impled, impled, sorry, blah, blah, blah. when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my prayer, my house will be a house of prayer. That's what I was going to ask Evelyn because that's one of her favorite verses. They're still selling in the temple. Now, let me give them a little bit of um, support. They're selling in the temple because, number one, you needed to change your money from your Roman, denari Roman coin. I don't know if I'm right, so I'm not going to say it. Is denarius right, Bob? I'm looking at you. Yeah. To ch change it to Jewish currency. Also, because you came so, so, so far of an area, you couldn't necessarily carry your sacrifices with you, so it made sense to buy them there. That makes sense, doesn't it? That, that's, that's, that's nice. That's nice that they do it. But they did it to gain money, power, control, to live for the things of this world. Because God knows their heart. They didn't do it for the right reasons, even though it might have looked good on the surface. And Jesus knows their heart. And he says that his father's house is supposed to be a place of prayer, which Kim focused on last week, which one of the reasons that the disciples had to go back to Jerusalem in the first place, to be gathered with one mind, one accord, born again, but not empowered by or filled by the Holy Spirit so they could pray for the coming of this promise of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer. He puts himself on the level of God himself. But you have made it a den of robbers because I know your heart. So I have to ask myself here again and ask you the question, are we a house of prayer? Because going back with what Kim said again, if we don't have the prayer, we don't have the effectiveness, guys. If this ministry of Awanas means something to you, and don't think we're not facing a spiritual battle, we may get right in like we did last year and then have to close our doors again or decide to keep them open and then what, what are people going to point their fingers at? Or will someone get sick and die? There's just so many variables. Or do we proclaim God's message in, in, in prayer consider the consequences and pray for boldness we probably won't make it there today that's the end of Acts chapter 4 and it's not wrong to pray for health so that you can proclaim God's message too I, proclaim, I pray one of my prayers that I pray all the time is for health with my body and my mind so that I can proclaim yeah I'll get the benefits of doing other things too <laughs> being able to still do things but I want to be able to have a sound mind and a sound body so that I can proclaim God's message because it is something that motivates and drives me. So are we a house of prayer? 
the Spirit's not going to answer us. I give you the scripture to back that up where Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray and then says to pray with urgency to keep asking, to keep knocking. And why wouldn't our Heavenly Father, because we have some idea in our own mind of what a good earthly father should look like, whether we had a good one or not, but how much would our Heavenly Father give us the Holy Spirit? Not answer your prayers the way you want to, but give you the Holy Spirit so that you'll be able to live through this world and we see in the filling of the Holy Spirit to proclaim. <clears throat> Verse 47, though, every day he was teaching in the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. And now they're faced with John and Peter and all these new converts from everywhere under the sun. And what are they going to do? There's already 3,000 of them. They've got to do something. And as we read on, we'll see that there'll be 5,000 of them. And they need to do something to stamp it out, but they don't know what to do again. They thought if they got rid of Jesus, that would stop that. that. And Peter, you know, he wouldn't even uh, admit that he was a follower of Jesus back then. Look at him now. Then we get to Luke chapter 20. After clearing the temple, the religious leaders again questioned Jesus' authority. One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law together with the elders came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things. They said, who gave, gave you this authority? He re replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me then, John's baptism, was it from heaven or human origin? Now, if the Holy Spirit reveals the words to us to say and He reveals Jesus to us, th man, that is, from a debate standpoint, that's an incredible statement that Jesus made. Because He was smart enough to say, empowered enough by the Holy Spirit to say, uh, knowing enough of Scripture to say, prayerful enough to say, let me just solve this issue. You answer my question. And that shut down the argument. Jesus doesn't tell them by whose authority. But now in Acts chapter 4, they know by whose authority Peter and John are doing this. They followed Jesus for three and a half years. And they saw that these men, and we read that in the scripture, were uneducated and everything. But they knew scriptures powerfully. They knew they were common men who feared for their lives, but now they're speaking boldly. Something should ding in their head. But they're so fixed on their power and their income and everything else, they're not willing to give that up. They're not willing to give up the treasures of this world to build up treasures in heaven. And they're blinded. Acts chapter 4. I gave you that to set up the background for it. Verse 1, The priests, the captains of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to, speaking to, the, temp, to the people. Now, chapter 3, I'll remind you, happened at 3 p.m. It happened after the hour of sacrifice. It happened at the hour of prayer. Peter and John didn't go to the hour of sacrifice. Uh-oh, they were already on the bad side of the religious leaders because religious leaders didn't get nothing in their pocket from Peter and John. And if the fo if people follow after them... It's going to hit their pocket again, isn't it? And not only is it going to hit their pocket, but the Sadducees are there. And as Bob says, the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they have no hope in the resurrection. They taught the people that there was no resurrection of the dead. Somebody got to the church later in Timothy, 35 years later, and said the resurrection had already happened. It's all key to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you believe who he says he is, he will come again and you will have eternal life. So won't that make a difference in how you live your life? And won't you proclaim it? <clears throat> Verse 2, They, these same religious leaders who crucified Jesus, were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming the resur in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they're not only proclaiming that Jesus rose from the dead, which you don't see any denial here from the religious leaders. They don't produce a body or anything else. But now the disciples are pre preaching that not only did Jesus rise, but everybody who follows after him, which is contrary to the preaching 
and teachings of the religious leaders, they will have re resurrection from the dead. I don't know about you, but I'm signing up with the apostles for sure, right? So they're, they are threatened and their pockets are hurt. So what do they want to do? Get rid of Peter and John and the man. You remember back to John chapter 12 when Lazarus is sitting at the, the table also and everybody's gathered around him? Dude, were you really dead? I, that's the story I've heard and everything else. And yeah, I was dead. I was, I was to the point of stinketh. That's what scripture says. So he's testimony, he's proclaiming, is getting people to say, who is this Jesus? And is there really resurrection? Verse 3, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, so now it's 6 o'clock, they can't do anything else, they put them in jail for the night until the next day. Verse 4, but many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. In spite of religion getting in the way, religion was the problem, God still added to their numbers because of their prayer because of the way they live their lives and the way that they're proclaiming salvation, resurrection through Jesus Christ. Proper living, if you want the proper P. Verse 5, the next day, the elders, it's the next day now, we know that, whatever that is, day 348, I think I said 347 last time. I made that number up, just so you know, okay? But the next day, we know it's the next day, the elders, the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Now, you've got a who's who list next if you don't understand this. You've got Annas the high priest was there, so was Caphias. They're both high priests. Caphias is the current, but obviously Luke knows that Annas still has the power, so he's running the show. And there's John, Alexander, and the others of the high priest family. They said to Peter, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. And what do they ask? The same thing they asked Jesus before when he cleansed the temple. Oh, yeah. And our bodies are temples. It's where God dwells now. Maybe I need to look a little more at whether I need to be cleansed. They asked, by what power or what name did you do this? <laughs> the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit which I am born again, I am a new child, a new creation in Christ, and I have seen the filling of His Spirit so that I can proclaim even in every tongue of every tribe and every nation. Because remember, Luke spells that out, that it's basically, you could map it out, and it's the known world at that time, the, the languages are. <clears throat> so it's by the power of the Holy Spirit, the name of J Jesus. Wow. And we look back, and it looks like deja vu all over again, that the spiritual leaders are still trying to destroy it and destroy the truth. In Acts chapter 2, if you remember verse 36, Peter said, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. They heard this that day. It's, it's come around to them. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. But verse 37 is totally different than what we see here in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 37 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? You don't see this here from the religious leaders because they're not willing to give up their power, their prestige, their money, and they make it a mission to destroy the followers of Jesus. Remember when Jesus said, don't be surprised if you suffer? Verse 8, Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And I told you, you can go back to chapter 3 and look. It doesn't say Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit when he told the lame man to get up and walk. Peter was walking in step with the Spirit, as we learn from Scripture. He knew this is what he was supposed to do because he was in tune with the Spirit. He knew the Spirit would do this. I don't know how it blows me away. But it does, Scripture specifically does not say that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Catch that. Because when you see the filling of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to see it more in Acts, you're going to see proclamation. You can be reading Scriptures, studying Scriptures. You can pray till you just can't pray no more. Whether you write it down or pray out loud or pray in your closet. 
and you can live such a holy life, but if you don't proclaim Jesus Christ, you're missing the point. That's the whole reason that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, so we could continue in His work. God's amazing, amazing, saving grace. And if you believe in Jesus who rose from the dead, you will rise from the dead. How can you keep quiet about that? How can you not study so you're approved? How can you not pray for those that you won't save, which should be everybody, including your enemies? How can you not serve by faith where you can serve? If he's not calling you to sell everything and go overseas, I certainly would want to serve here in our honors program then. How's that for a thing, Kim? Did, did that as a good plug like you did? <laughs> How can you not want to serve in the Iwanis program? And let me say this here too. The people that are here, this family serves so well. I'm so proud of how much you serve and the love you have. But I want you to know the mission that we have so that you pray, so that you cleanse the temple, and so that you proclaim just out of the heart that you have because the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. <clears throat> Remember Jesus' word from the earlier part of Luke. He said in Luke chapter 12, There is nothing concealed that will be disclosed. This is verse 2. Or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the, ear, in the inner rooms will be claimed from the, proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledge me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of the Lord. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be for forgiven. Now, Peter and John, I know these words are echoing in their ears because Jesus spoke these two words to them. They don't have them written down on paper yet so they can study them. They just remember from Jesus preaching them and the Holy Spirit revealing them at this moment to them. Because verse 11 says, When you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. It's only been a short period of time since they brought Jesus out, had him whipped where his body, as Isaiah says, was not even recognizable and nailed upon a cross, spit in his face and the placard over him mockingly put King of the Jews. Do you think John and Peter are scared? I guarantee you they are. But that fear is wiped totally away because the Holy Spirit fills them. <clears throat> Verse 12, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time, at that moment, what you should say. And we have the second recording of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And here's what Peter, Peter says after being filled. He says, rulers and elders of the people, if we're, go, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this very similar to what he said to the people in Acts chapter 2. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I told you before that of Nazareth was just a plug to hit them even harder because nothing good comes out of Nazareth. But it is by his name that we've been given this authority. By his name that we've been given this power. He is the one, continuing in that verse, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. I don't know if you caught that when you read it. This is the next day, and that man is still standing with them, just like Lazarus was at the supper. Makes me think they arrested him too, and they're plotting his death also. He's just been healed. Forty years of being lame, 
and he's just been healed. He wants to live his life. He wants to go skydiving and everything else. But is he willing to give it all up to follow Jesus and get the bigger reward? Does he really believe? Does he believe that Jesus has the power that those that call upon his name will be raised from the dead? <clears throat> Verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. It implies building again. And the Pharisees know Psalms 118. Merle read the first four verses, but I want to read you the psalm so that these words will ring in your ears. And as you study Scripture more, the Holy Spirit will reveal that to you so you can understand that Peter and John were fearing for their life, but they were at total peace. And the Spirit gave them exactly, and Luke records, we don't know how many times they're filled prior to that, but this is the second time that Luke writes about it, that they're filled simply so that they have the words to say to those who have the power to kill their body, but not destroy their souls. And he quotes, Peter quotes from Psalm 118, which reads, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Now, it's tough to read that. Think about that verse in that predicament. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, not, you know, but Israel say His love endures forever because He has said woe and woe and woe time and time again to the Pharisees and now the Sadducees. But they're not sad, you see, unfortunately. Let Israel say, His love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron, this is the priest, say, Let his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. But these words fall on deaf ears, at least at this point. <clears throat> Verse 5, that's where Merle left off. When hard pressed, because I am now, Peter and John, aren't I? Now I cry to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord I will cut them down. They sur surround me on every side, but in the name of the Lord I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. Now, like I said, the Sadducees and the religious rulers know that Peter has just quoted, and, he's, and I'm coming up to that verse, all these things, and they're getting even more mad. Just like they told Jesus, do you know, do you know your words offend us? Peter's doing the exact same thing because the Holy Spirit's giving him the power to do it. They want to surely crucify him now. But he's not worried because the Holy Spirit has filled him and he has these words to say. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength. He is my defense. And he has become my salvation. That's verse 14. I know those words are echoing in, the, in the, the hearts and in the minds of Peter and John and this lame man that we don't even know his name. The Lord is their strength, their defense, and their salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live, and I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but He has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which, through which the righteous may enter. And Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by Him. <clears throat> I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. But you're also the stone that the builders rejected. And you have become the, the, the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. It is marvelous in your eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. 
The Lord is God, and He has made His light shine on us. With, bo with bows in hand, join in the festival procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. That's what Peter quoted from. Those words gave Peter strength. Those words gave the religious leaders animosity, anger, hatred because they wouldn't listen to the words. And they're so clear, a slap in the face to them. But yet they hang on to the things of this world instead of clinging to Jesus. The next words Peter says in Acts chapter 4 is verse 12. You know that, that verse. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. Do you see that sermon there they got? Because Peter listened to the Holy Spirit and quoted Old Testament Scripture again. But they weren't cut to the heart. That's the difference. Verse 13, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, because they saw that also, and they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. <laughs> but still nothing. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, they didn't take notice of this mighty miracle just like they did with Jesus. There was nothing they could say. They couldn't say anything to, to, to do anything at this time. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it just like they could not deny the resurrection. They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. That was their answer. <laughs> hey, 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 mighty miracles, everything else. I know you've quoted the scripture to me that, that is telling me that I should be listening and that you're bringing the truth and that you're protected. God is your salvation. And you're saying there is no other name given among men by which we can be saved except Jesus Christ. Uh, but I'm not going to listen, so be quiet. Don't stop praying. They didn't say that. Don't stop doing proper living. They said stop proclaiming. So I say that again. If you don't get the point, <laughs> we've got to proclaim. Or what good is it? Why did Jesus leave us behind on this earth except to proclaim? And you have the authority and the power to do that so there is no excuse. <clears throat> Verse 17. But to stop this thing, <laughs> this salvation process, from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. It's clear here. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. So he even threw it back on them again. So I have to ask myself again, Am I proclaiming? Well, if it's not because anyone is commanding me who can kill me to not proclaim, then why am I not? Is it because I'm following my other master still and I, I'm pursuing these things that I should have given up long ago to pursue Jesus? Is it because I'm not prayerful enough and not uh, uh, living holy enough lives gathered together on mission? Why is it that I'm not proclaiming? Or am I proclaiming? I have an opportunity to proclaim Awanas and every one of you has an opportunity to do there. And you know what? Polly and Kim would probably appreciate if some of you proclaimed up here when I'm not here. And some of you have, thank you. You have that opportunity. If you ever won't because you feel led that the Holy Spirit is giving you something to proclaim I'll sit right there and listen to you I have no problem doing that and I'm going back to Florida in December just so you know <laughs> and I'm glad to hear that you were happy with what Dick had to say because he might be the one that's here <laughs> because he's not a preacher anymore and he, and he told me the other day, he said, anytime you need me to come preach for you, let me know. 
because I need the opportunity to proclaim. <laughs> you can't stay silent. Well, here's what Peter went on to say. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't stay silent. After further threats, they let them go. What are they going to do? They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and elders had said to them. So what did they report back to the people? We better be quiet or they're going to come and throw us in jail or, or, or kill us. And I'm going to leave to next week what they said back, but you know the answer. They didn't pray for persecution not to come. They prayed for boldness to proclaim. Wow. They knew the mission that they had. They were of one mind and one accord. They saw, saw God moving powerfully for them. They understood the power of the Holy Spirit in the birth, development, growth of the church. And they understood their part in this. I'm going to end with verse 24 of Scripture here. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Isn't that exactly what Kim told you last week? And she just was willing. Said, oh yeah, I'll go Acts chapter 4. And then the devil started saying, why are you doing this? You're not a preacher. You don't know how to pray even. You're going to talk about pray prayer. So Kim said, ha, 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 I'll write it down. Flee from me, devil. You have no authority here. You have no power here. And she did a wonderful job. Thank you for being obedient. Now, I got a question for you. How did Luke know what the Sanhedrin talked about, or the rulers and everything talked about in private? How'd that come out? Well, it could have came out from Peter and John explaining everything. But Peter and John didn't know what they talked about when they went back in their closed doors. You catch that from Scripture? You know what I think? Because I know my God is in sovereign control and everything else. I think there was a young man named Saul there. And he heard Psalm 118 that day from just one verse that Peter said. And he realized there was power in no other name. Salvation no other way than Jesus Christ. And the day that Jesus revealed that to him, his life was forever changed. It didn't happen that day when Peter did it, but it happened on the road to Damascus later. I hope and pray that day has come for every one of you. Don't be denying <clears throat> salvation. Don't be going against the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to close, and I hope that you'll pray with me and continue to pray with a prayer for Awanas, for our ministry, to have boldness in proclaiming, to take away the, the spiritual battles that we'll be fighting in the households and in our church and, things, and pray for help and everything else. So I'm going to close that way with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We thank you that he taught us that he would never forsake us, that he would ask you and you would send the Holy Spirit, the gift promised to us from the beginning of time. The story that we have in creation, that the Spirit hovered up over the waters, the creative power that was there, the power that led Jesus out in the wilderness to be tempted and also gave Jesus the power to tell the, the devil that he wasn't going to live by bread alone, even though he was hungry. That he was going to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. That he wasn't going to twist scripture and that he wasn't going to worry about the things of this earth. He was going to cast them all aside. He already had cast them all aside. He cast heaven aside to come and be born by the very creation that he created that denied him and sinned against him. And then he obediently went to the cross after sweating blood teardrops for us. Because with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. He took our sin and shame upon his shoulders. 
And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And here we are gathered today in Jesus' name, knowing that he raised from the dead, knowing that we have a hope that should be proclaimed. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us to be people of prayer. That this house, that our bodies are temples filled with prayer. That we know that if we make our petitions to you, we know that those prayers are effective. That we know that you will answer them. And we pray that thy kingdom come and thy will be done. We pray for power to proclaim your word. We pray that you take Satan away from this ministry. That you give us a fervency and a heart to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And to fill every desire that we have with your word. And that the spirit reveals Jesus in all truth to us. And transforms us from the inside out and gives us power to proclaim, even in such a way that we'll know that that didn't come from our own, that that was a mighty miracle of the Holy Spirit coming through us. Father, we pray for the families that will be involved in Awana. We pray for the children. Lord, we pray that you're binding Satan from their homes right now, that you're creating them in their hearts, that you're pricking their hearts so that they don't worry about the things of this world, but they know that their children need to be trained up and that they give us the opportunity to help in that training. And we thank you for the Awana program and all the Awana programs going on, Lord. We thank you for the years of their faithfulness. I grew up in Awana's program. My mom taught in Awana's program. Lord, I'm just so thankful for, for that. And Lord, as we fight this spiritual battle, I thank you for the armor that we have of yours that it will quench every fiery dart of the devil, and that's what I ask you for. I ask for unity in this body, that we will be prayerfully dependent, that we'll be one mind and one accord for the mission that you have set before us. And Lord, we pray that we'll see numbers like we see in the book of Acts. Not that it's about numbers, but that we'll see people in this lifetime making decisions to follow you. If we don't, we'll be satisfied there also because we know that your word won't go out void. But Lord, I just pray also that we get to see some of those uh, children and parents come to you and make decisions to follow you. Lord, I pray for each and every one here that's a part of this body and I thank you for their input in this functioning body that we have. With you as our head, we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we long for the day that he returns. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.